Let me begin by thanking the governing body, principal, and fellows of Pusey House, as well as the fellowship and master of St. Cross College, University of Oxford, for permitting me to be elected as lay academic fellow of Pusey House and Pusey Fellow of St. Cross College, respectively. Additionally, the Aquinas Institute of Blackfriars Hall, which is the work of Father Richard Conrad, has provided me a home for the past few years, and I've happily been affiliated with the Hall since 2010. Father Richard Finn had in mind an inclusive Hall, where true intellectual diversity was permitted. It was by his acceptance that I arrived in Michaelmas 2010 to receive tuition from Professor Roger Scruton. I hope the work we do here at Pusey House and the work I'm able to do at St. Cross College can continue to cooperate with the good work being done at Blackfriars. Finally, Oriel College, where I've been a member since 2015 and which since my first summer school there in 2003 has always felt to me like Oxford should be. I thank Oriel for continuing the legacy of Newman, for being both modern and ancient at the same time. And through its chapel services, formal halls, common rooms, and libraries, allowing me to experience a remnant of Christendom as a living tradition. The lecture that follows lasts about 40 minutes. It would, have been, it would not have been possible for me to produce this lecture, but for the tuition that Professor Philip Carey gave me as a loud-mouthed, fledgling philosopher. Thank you for tolerating my noise and attempting to organize it into musica. And for your book, Augustine's Invention of the Inner Self, OUP 1999, which presents the truly original thesis of which the one that follows is a mere footnote. Secondly, my co-author on the chapter that forms the Augustinian backbone of this article, Brother Bede Mullins, formerly my most precocious student at Blackfriars and now a friend and collaborator. The excellences that follow are his and the errors are mine. Our chapter, Augustine, I'm sorry, Augustine and Identity Politics, will appear in an edited volume in January 2021 called Augustine in a Time of Crisis, which incidentally was begun before the current pandemic crisis, but now is, I suppose, even more fitting. Finally, that which follows is a work in progress. Just after I complete an ongoing project on the theological origins of modern contract doctrine, I'll leapfrog to the book length treatment of these ideas. All comments, criticisms, and pointers are thus more than welcome. Question, what unites an English nationalist, a Palestinian liberation fighter, a Salafi Islamist, and a queer activist? This is not a joke, but a question now addressed even in the gilded parts of the culture. Francis Fukuyama's 2018 book, Identity, the demand for dignity and the politics of resentment answers that a contemporary form of identity politics unites them. This new identity politics is different from the older class, religion, or national accounts, with us at least since the 19th century, wherein large collectives claimed individual persons as their own, and those persons pledged allegiance to said collectives despite great differences among or between these persons. The new politics of identity involves ever smaller so-called communities formed largely by association in which one aspect of a person's identity is presented and accepted as definitional of that person because it is said to attach to who she really is, to her deep identity. I imagine an unofficial theme song of this sort of self-identifying identity politics comes not from the gilded parts, but the more sequined parts of the culture. If you'll permit me to quote from Lady Gaga's 2001 Born This Way, Ms. Gaga says, Don't be a drag, just be a queen, whether you're broke or evergreen. You're black, you're white, beige, chola descent, you're Lebanese, you're orient. 
Whether life's disabilities left you outcast, bullied, or teased, rejoice and love yourself today, cause baby, you were born this way. I apologize for Ms. Gaga's retrograde language. The song is already nine years old and things have indeed changed, but perhaps she was just born that way. And having been born that way, she had the lived experience of being that way a term gifted to posterity by Simone de Beauvoir. And she is therefore, that is Ms. Gaga, inscrutable in her choices by outsiders or by any of us. To be clear in what I'm suggesting, contemporary identity politics is not a form of self-creation, but a form of self-identification and self-discovery, resident more with the romantic movement of Jean-Jacques Rousseau than the existentialist movement of Jean-Paul Sartre. And Rousseau's romanticism owes much more to Saint Augustine than is readily acknowledged in the literature, even as writers such as Francis Fukuyama do comment on the relation. The argument that follows runs more or less like this. Augustine's thought presents two types of interiority. One is shared and universal, and humans were always meant to have it, according to him. The other comes about only after the fall. Fallen interiority is a philosophical ancestor of modern interior identity. Its modern form serves as the locus of the true self, and therefore of moral autonomy. Rousseau puts this anthropology of interiority into service at just the place where desire identity, and recognition intersect, namely moral philosophy. Contemporary identity politics has appropriated Rousseauian interiority as its philosophical anthropology, while continuing to operate within a liberal order or, as I'll term it, universal rights politics. The liberal political order is vulnerable to divergent anthropologies, particularly because of its deference to the rights and prerogatives of the individual. This, this lecture, and indeed the chapter upon which it's based, seeks to begin to account for the Augustinian origins of the current Rousseauian identity politics. The particular political tension could only be explained adequately with reference to recent history and contemporary debates. Still, the conceptual grounding of political phenomena in the language of interiority and in the character of human identity and desire is not novel. The language of interiority comes largely from St. Augustine's Confessions, with political reverberations in his De Civitati Dei. The current idiom of this Augustinian inheritance is largely the work of Rousseau, who turned Augustine, Augustine's inner self into an inner sanctum and provided the legacy with a clearer soul-state relation. Augustine famously prevent, uh, presents two cities, that of God and that of man. Supporting these respective cities are two loves, operating from within two interiors that have been formed by those loves. But as we shall see, there are at least three forms of politics compatible with Augustinian interiority. He says, love of self, even to the contempt of God made the earthly city, whereas love of God, even to the contempt of self made the heavenly one. A shallow analogy might be drawn between the two politics mentioned above, universal rights politics, and identity politics, and the principal loves that Augustine mentions, one selfless and the other selfish, these which govern Augustine's two cities. Universal rights politics eschews particular interests, recalling the contemptus sui that marks the heavenly city, while identity politics affirms a love of oneself in all of its earthly garb. One could object that neither of these politics aspires to be a city of God, even before considering the reasons that Augustine could have for believing that no earthly politics could ever be identified with the heavenly city. The two rival politics are chiefly distinguished 
by their understanding of the relative importance placed on individually chosen identity and personal desire. Augustine connects a city's character to the character of its citizens, specifically to the love that characterizes a city and the love shared by its citizens. A people, or populus for Augustine, is, quote, a group of several rational creatures bound together by a harmonious sharing of things which it loves, of the things which it loves. Again, a group of several rational creatures bound together by a harmonious sharing of the things which it loves. Consequently, again quoting Augustine, it is the things that a people loves which must be examined in order to see what kind of a people it is. Although the city and citizens that character, uh, sorry, although the city and citizens' characters are twinned, Augustine nowhere offers a soul state analogy like that of, for instance, Plato's Republic, which is the most famous edition of that in our history. Yet his assistance on the naturally social character of man allows the connection to be organic. Augustine appeals to our common ancestry in Adam, which confers on us both our individual psychological makeup and our unity with one another. It also is the origin of the city. Augustine says, in this first man, we think that there had already risen up in the human race societies like two cities, not yet for all to see, but already in God's foreknowledge. The whole history of the human race is contained by anticipation in Adam for Augustine. Something of the unity that was in the one man remains in mankind, so that Augustine can say, there is nothing like this kind of being, so disharmonious in vice, so social in nature. Adam's patriarchy bonds individual persons to society, and the mediating power of that bond is experienced concretely as shared desire or love. Beyond the realm of private affection or the most intimate relations, for instance, the mother-child bond, a human comes to love other humans by sharing with them some third object of love. Understanding why this is so requires examination of the interior of man, or the interior man, who in Augustine's anthropology is the first subject of desire. Again, Augustine does not elaborate a physiology of the inner man like we find in Plato's Republic's tripartite soul, with kinds of desire attributed to different parts of the soul. Augustine, particularly in the Confessions, tends to talk of desire or love as a single, undifferentiated category. He alike enjoys, or as he says, fruiteur, love-making with women at the beginning of the Confessions in Book 3, and then a foretaste of the division of God in Confession 7. In The City of God, he makes a point of appealing to scripture to justify the use of amor and delexio to describe the love both of good and of evil things. Yet with, his Platon, yet with his Platonic sympathies, Augustine wouldn't deny that we perceive and desire God by the intellect and corporeal things by the senses. But he adds to this picture a renewed emphasis on the experience of unity we have in acting and living. The sometimes painful fault lines between competing parts of our soul and the compulsion we are put under when one part of the soul comes to dominate testify to this uneasy unity. While these parts do battle within us, each is only one person acting with one will that is, one faculty of loving, to bind. The language of interiority easily emerges in order to communicate the union of these parts of the soul under one whole. Plato's own imagery denies such unity, allowing each part of the soul to become its own monstrous or humane homunculus. The city of God posits two loves at the foundation of the two cities, 
Confessions insists on two kinds of love, cultivating two interiors in man. The first is familiarly Platonic, Plotinus being Augustine's proximate source for this Platonism. Interiority here is closely associated with, distinctive account, with a distinctive account of understanding. Plato had insisted that the forms were the true objects of understanding. A turning away from changeable things was required to access these realities. Plotinus transforms the Platonic inheritance by reasoning that the forms can only exist in understanding as objects of intellect, and intellect is within the soul. A turn to the forms is then a turn inward to the soul, where we discover a point of contact within the single universal understanding with a capital U, which is home to the forms. One turns in and then looks up to see the forms, as Philip Carey puts it in his book, Augustine's Invention of the Inner Self. Augustine adapts this Platonian picture to Christian orthodoxy. Within oneself, God is discovered, the source of one's being, and the forms in him. One's interior is no longer the shared space of a single universal understanding, but, quote, an interior place that is not a physical place, interiori loco non loco, which is properly my own. Even if the God I encounter there is the same God who can be met by all people in their own interior. One turns in and looks up through the forms, through them, to experience God himself. Augustine strikes an unexpected balance between the privacy of the interior space and a single shared vision. Reason or intellect was always naturally the inner part of us, but inner did not always mean hidden or opaque. Before the fall, its privileged access to God lent it a translucency to oneself and to others, all the translucency associated with clear understanding. Now, if we can reappropriate it for that privileged access, it promises to be our way back to the patria, so to unite rather than to divide us. Seeking out that way, Augustine takes up the Platonian maxim, ready in te ipsum, return into yourself, in Di Doctrina Christiana, one, a near contemporary work of, of, of the Confessions. And it associates our return to the patria by the proper use of the created world with one line from the book of Romans, quote, the invisible things of God may be clearly understood, that is, intellecta conspicuuntur, through created things. The same Pauline text occurs in the passage of the Confessions, where Augustine, quote, returns into himself and experiences a brief foretaste of the vision of God. As if a proof of the unitive power of that vision, at the culmination of these, quote, mystical experiences, after the definitive moment of his baptism, Augustine enjoys an anticipation of heavenly beatitude, together with Monica, his mother, one of the very few mystical experiences ever recounted by saints or popularly in Christian literature. Ordinarily, however, we find ourselves exclaustrated from this interior space, or as Augustine poetically put it, I was without while you were within. In this life, sin prevents us from inhabiting it lastingly. The self-direction of the love that ought to be for God makes, makes man inclinatus ad se ipsum, bent over toward himself. Hunchback man generates another interior space from which others and even God are shut out just as he likewise is shut out from the true inner sight of communion with God. This terrestrial interiority really is private, a dark room by contrast with that other inner yet luminous agora. In it, um, it is an interiority that was never meant to exist, even if, after sinning, it seems 
natural. This interior, and here one might imagine it as, say, a many-roomed cave, corresponds with the dispersion and desire for created things. The narrative arc of the confessions indicates, however, a way out of one's inner cave into the luminous agora, where a single-hearted desire for God draws our persons into unity. By inhabiting one or the other interior over the course of one's life, or by vacillating between them, when pulled by his love, man is accordingly also a citizen of the heavenly or the earthly city. There he is joined by degrees to others who are bound by the same love. Inner privacy becomes, for Augustine, the root to political legitimacy. He first characterizes the privacy of the terrestrial interior with reference to desire, saying, imagine, little by little, I was becoming aware of where I was, and I would want to communicate my desires to those by means of whom they could be brought about, and I could not, since the desires were inside, but other people were outside, and by no awareness of their own could they enter into my soul. In her life here, is not just the sum total of thoughts and feelings, but the morally charged content of our desires. Augustine will shortly confess the guilt of infancy, and not only his own, but in general, saying, quote, the imbecility of infant limbs is innocent, not the spirit of infants. Erratic infant behavior manifests a tumultuous soul, the restlessness of heart, that he also confesses at the beginning of Confessions. But what is really disturbing is the child's violent demand for obedience from adults that surround it. The same lust for domination over other humans so frequently char characterizes earthly political regimes. But man was not meant to have dominion over, oh, sorry, but man was meant to have dominion over the beasts and not over other men. So, any dispensation in which one man lords over another, as is unavoidably the case with all political constitutions, is contrary to the intentions of God. This is not to say that political regimes themselves are necessarily sinful. They are necessary as a corrective to sinful tendencies, but, again quoting Augustine, take away justice, then what are kingdoms except bands of robbers? <clears throat> One upshot of the ambiguous moral quality of political arrangements is that, in practice, a political settlement can be founded not on the basis of a shared object of love, but from recognition that warring desires and self-interest need to be moderated for the good of all. Although Augustine does not explicitly enunciate this, let's call it proto-Hobbesian thesis, it is an obvious implication of his insistence that even corrupted things, in order to maintain themselves in being, in being, tend necessarily toward a certain kind of peace. Here we might usefully distinguish a populace united by a shared love or positive peace from a societas, living together, free of violence, sharing a negative peace. A populace might have a national anthem, a shared ancestor, or generate public art in celebration of what it commonly cherishes. A societas can liberally proclaim, live, and let live. Consequently, if we want to align our two competing contemporary politics, that is, universal rights politics and identity politics, with Augustinian models of political cohesion, we actually have three options the heavenly city, and two varieties of the earthly city. One held together by a shared love, other than God, or other than love of God, and one by a desire for a provisional kind of peace. There is no question of aligning either universal rights or identity politics with the heavenly city. The citizens of the heavenly city are mere pilgrims here, whose home is elsewhere. Both the politics of identity and the politics of universal rights are premised on the validity 
the goodness even, the manifest goodness of the earthly city. As such, they are both modes of an essentially secular politics. We might nonetheless see them corresponding to the two modes of earthly society that emerge from Augustine's text. Liberal, rights-based politics, whose aim is to keep away from involvement in the particular needs, interests, or desires of any more strictly defined group than the human race, looks rather like an idealization of the societas which seeks utopia as mere peaceful coexistence. By contrast, an identity politics which is frank about the inevitability of attachments on the basis of more concrete desires and identities is dependent on and fosters the existence of populi, distinct groups that are united by some common love. Perhaps telling in favor of this analysis is that populi can exist alongside or within a wider societas, just as identity politics is now represented, represented in a broader liberal political arrangement, even if the fundamental motivations of the two are at odds. The foregoing analysis does not equip us with easy tools to evaluate these options in contemporary politics. Augustine's portrayal of the earthly city against the heavenly might preclude any attempt at a positive politics, not least when the political options are avowedly secular, positivistic, or even atheistic. While a universal rights politics may fulfill more exclusively the rightful functions that Augustine assigns to a political regime in a fallen world, namely the administration of justice, it seems just as likely to be untenable. Sure, a neutral common language might be found and justice can be administered for the sake of peaceful coexistence, but this is not because of any deep foundation in the human heart. Rather, it is done pragmatically. Worryingly, it is liable to cover up so many petty and even unlawful interests that clutter our desires under a veneer of objective and neutral discourse. An identity politics is more realistic and more honest to our fallenness. Amor meus, pondus meum, my love, my weight, as Augustine says. Like it or not, we are dragged about in all of our dealings by our desires. Accordingly, a shared love of almost any object, good or bad, stands to foster a far stronger unity than the pragmatic calculation to avoid fights could ever do. Social contract theories, which provide the most plausible rationale for liberal politics that could be gleaned from Augustine, are often premised on a denial of any essential unity among humans of the kind that Augustine believed in so strongly. Augustine's developed account of interiority is a major forebear of the conception of the individual as a bearer of his or own unique identity, a path that Augustine himself does not tread. Such an identity is not readily recognizable by others since it is the same as the inner self rather than say the body or being the same as the body or being the same as one's public biography. Why might Augustine have rejected such unicity? Augustine treats sin as a proud turning to the self, a love of self in contempt for God and for others. It reverses both precepts of charity. If a hidden interiority and a unique identity is understood to be wholly self-created or self-constructed rather than God-given or God-created, Augustine would consider it diabolical. Nevertheless, the Confessions involves intense introspection. Augustine defers to the vagaries of his own autobiography, a moral, emotional, and intellectual interior odyssey. Couple this autodidactic interiority with his emphasis on the inscrutability of persons, preeminently of God, and materials are ripe 
to be developed. Still, to make Augustine's inner self serviceable to any sort of politics, that interior space would have to undergo remarkable changes. Rousseau will appropriate Augustinian interiority, not to the end of self-creation, but to that of self-discovery, basing his politics on the knowledge of that true and hidden self. Rousseau presents a politics of sacred interiority. And some of Rousseau's musings about man's interiority are strikingly, or seem to be, striking echoes of Augustine. He says, Leave those vain moralists, my friend, and return to the depth of your soul. That is where you will always rediscover the sacred fire which so often inflamed us with love of the sublime virtues. That is where you will see the eternal image of true beauty, the contemplation of which inspires us with a holy enthusiasm. The differences between Rousseau and Augustine, however, are notable, particularly concerning what one encounters in the depths of souls, where it is for Rousseau an innate principle of justice and virtue, according to which, in spite of our own maxims, we judge our actions and those of others as good or bad. A little later, he addresses this principle that he's just spoken of directly. Conscience, conscience, divine instinct, immortal and celestial voice, certain guide of a being that is ignorant and limited, but intelligent and free, infallible judge of good and bad, which makes man like unto a god. I'm sorry, which makes man like unto God. Conscience here has taken the place of God. Accordingly, where Augustine had opened his confessions in consternation at restless native desire, praising God as source of the only true peace, Rousseau's wonder is directed at his own unique, pristine, and self-sufficient being. Elsewhere, he says, I am not made like any I have seen. I venture to believe I was not made like any that exist. I am not more deserving. If I am not more deserving, at least I am different. The restlessness of the heart should be interpreted via, that is, the restlessness of the heart here, the incontestable maxim that the first movement of natures are always right. There is no original perversity in the human heart. Let me quote that once more. The incontestable maxim that the first movement, first movements of nature are always right. There is no original perversity in the human heart. As such, self-love need not become or be interpreted as pride. Consider again the crying infant, whom Augustine thinks is motivated by a selfish desire to have others at its beck and call. One upshot of an innate bent to sin inherited from its forefathers. For Rousseau, its crying is innocent. Up until adults begin responding wrongly, allowing the infant to learn the desire to dominate others. The infant stands in here for what Rousseau elsewhere calls a natural man. He who is as yet not formed, either for ill or for good. He says, to form this rare man, what must be done is to prevent anything from being done. He especially needs to be prevented from imitating conventional manners and feigning sentiments. Then he might not be lovely, but he will be more loving. He will be, in other words, sincere and authentic. An extended quote from Rousseau now. What makes man essentially good is to have few needs and to compare himself little to others. What makes him essentially wicked is to have many needs and so to depend very much on opinion. On the basis of this principle, it is easy to see how the passions of children and men can be directed to good or bad. 
It is true that since they are not always to live alone, it will be difficult for them always to be good. This same difficulty will necessarily increase with their relations, and this, above all, is why the dangers of society make art and care all the more indispensable for us to forestall in the human heart the depravity born of their new needs. Depravity born of new needs. In other words, man is born good. Men make him wicked. Civility breaks man's natural inclination so that he, quote, wants nothing as nature made it, not even man. He is then raised not for himself, but for others, like a tree in his garden. Rousseau prevent, presents the choice between making a man or a citizen, for one cannot make both at the same time. That is, unless somehow the political community could be fashioned bespoke according to the natural desires of man. Rousseau, seeking this, will need to move man, uh, we need to move man from proper self-love to politics. He will do so not through a traditional soul state analogy, but through what we've termed a soul state duality. It takes some work to undo what Rousseau sees as the natural desires already at work inside the unnatural desires already at work inside of man. He's, man has been taught nearly from his birth to love himself according to what others expect of him. He seeks affirmation, therefore, only from without. Rousseau analyzes self-love by the opposition of two forms of self-love, amour de soi and amour propre. Respectively, it's virtuous and vicious or base manifestations. These are two aspects of the sole passion natural to man, Rousseau says, which becomes good or bad only by the application made of it and the relations given to it. Man becomes bad by looking to others for direction and esteem, instead of looking to the depths of his soul, to, quote, the infallible judge of good and bad, which makes man like unto God. Singularly following his private conscience makes man good. Conscience here, is at the furthest remove from the faculty of deciding whether an action is good or evil in accordance with external or as they were called as it was called natural law conscience commands rather what is right for this specific person as according with her inner being and commands it the more strongly for being interior rousseau's conscience is not to be assimilated to, however, to a relativistic conception. One only becomes who one is supposed to be, both autonomous and free, by following one's infallible conscience. Like Augustine before him, Rousseau emphasizes the original unity of the human being, the amor de soi, amor propre de carne, for all the differences, still parallels the two loves of Augustine. Choosing obedience to oneself or to others is also choosing to be sincere over insincere, authentic over inauthentic, inner directed over other directed, a real self over an alienated self. The correct choice is obvious to all who have experienced their own uniqueness, who wish to restore the original wholeness of man or unicity as the word that's used in this tradition for uniqueness plus unity or wholeness. However, the narrow road is rarely taken with vicious consequences for both self and society. Rousseau says, self-love, ceasing to be an absolute sentiment, becomes pride in great souls, vanity in small ones, and feeds itself constantly in all, uh, in all at the expense of their neighbors pride in great souls, vanity in small ones, and feeds itself constantly at the expense of their neighbors.
and politics, this confusion of amours, leads to the missettlement of basic institutions. Rousseau connects the formation of the first assemblies very closely to systems of honor, to hierarchies, to distributions of prizes celebrating individual over communal achievement. Tremendous other regard, all in the orbit of amour prof. One way to avoid both the politics of pride and the psychological appropriation that is amour prof is to ensure that the political order is founded on a mot de soi. Each party to the social pact knowingly, quote, puts his person and his full power in common under the supreme direction of the general will, understanding that, quote, all enjoy the same rights, that is, in the resulting political community, in which all, or he in this case, should be able to realize as many of his own authentic desires as possible, and certainly more than if he lived alone. He is now a member of a body with a common interest. And since the political body formed of this pact is a direct democracy, he owes it the self-same obedience as he owes his own conscience. For it is the political extension of conscience, according to Rousseau. Formally, quote, the act of sovereignty, is a convention of the body with every one of its members. And being subjected only to conventions such as these, the members obey no one but their own will. Now, personal autonomy, that is being born free or self-legislation as the case may be, is said to be synonymous with the power of the state to make men free. And that should be more like now personal autonomy being born free or self-legislation is said to be autonomous with the power of the state to make men free or the chains of the common lawmaking authority. Thus, man is born free, but everywhere in chains, which Rousseau has proceeded to justify. I'll proceed to synthesize some of these thoughts and then round things out with a very short conclusion. Augustine and Rousseau each confess a privileged inner space unique to each human. For Rousseau, this interior has an absolute value. For Augustine, it must finally be transcended, with God taking the place of a perverted individuality. Both thinkers articulate a tension between the proper engagement with one's interior, characteristic of a morally upright man, and the exterior political life that he cannot avoid. Augustine or should seek out Rousseau. At its best, man's interior life is, respectively, either a way home to the heavenly city or a means of authentic self-knowledge that fits him for governing equals. For Augustine, the fallen interior of our earthly existence is a site of a journey back to the patria. It is not a source of moral norms containing conscience itself as it is for Rousseau. Rather, the way that space develops, or the way it is navigated, depends on the orientation of the will, toward or away from God. The heaven of our innermost depths, wherein we might enjoy God, can become a hell, if by sinning we retreat into it as a private, earthly interior. Rousseau reverses the order. The private interior is the source of moral knowledge that is perilously ignored whenever we orient ourselves according to the alien influences of others' desires. A similar tension persists into modern identity politics between that authentic interiority, the true self, and the political life in which the self is expressed and recognized while holding out against the imposition of others on the self. The problem is exacerbated because Modern identities often fall between the individual and the collective. They attach to special groups, which are not as unique as any individual, yet have distinct interests from the whole. It is not clear which sort of politics could affirm identity. Maybe different identities or different types of identity would require different politics. Neither is there general agreement what identity politics would mean in practice. However, 
If this is the role of Rousseauian interiority in contemporary politics, that which follows should also be considered a cautionary tale. There is great sense in seeking something more than mere liberalism as a united populace in order to share our identities and desires with others and to receive their recognition. The alternative would be to remain a loose societas, settling merely for negative peace. Put simply, there would seem to be a need for something like identity politics in order to make liberalism more humane. Yet, what renders identity politics a danger to liberalism is the claim of the unicity of the self. This fundament of identity is necessarily outside of public view, like the foundation of a house. It is within oneself, private, perhaps even in principle, incommunicable. The moral truth that begins in a hyper-individualized conscience, or idiomatically, who I really am, the way I was born, and which founds a free community of equals on that basis, does not admit of categorical claims to dignity. Whereas citizens of Augustine's heavenly city can pilgrim pro tempora, somewhat oblivious to forms of earthly politics, the latter-day inheritors of Rousseau's inner sanctum require a recognition available only when public toleration, or liberalism, turns to affirmation, facilitation, and promotion. They desire, as Augustine knew they should, to share a love that makes them a populace. And yet, a union of, sh of so many shared self-loves would seem to undermine the common good it strives to affirm. In an ironic twist, an identity politics corrected liberalism, far from being so many populi sheltered under a shared societas, would be partitioned into so many societates, which in pursuing their self-interest might make even negative liberty impossible. Allow me to end then by answering the question posed as the title of this lecture. Did St. Augustine invent identity politics? No. But he did invent both identity and politics, namely inward identity and secular politics as we now understand and continue to practice them. And he gave us the geography of the soul as a route, as the route to God. These divine sparks, as certain 18th century liberals called them, became the foundation of moral auto autonomy and political authority in democratic lands after Rousseau fused inward identity with secular politics and made the soul now a unique self into a god. That god, a self-sovereign, was, was meant to contract an authentic political life amongst so many other self-sovereigns. In the book-length treatment of these ideas, I'll go further to argue that Augustine's inner self is the historical philosophical precursor of modern Western spiritual materialism, as I call it. That is, the simultaneous claim that we are all mere dust, but that myself is also sacred. And, oh sorry, when the self is sacred, the material world can become literally immaterial. An idea with no ancient precursors known to me, but yet again, downstream from Augustine, voiced in a Rousseauian register. That said, I hope the foregoing has done something to elucidate the source and specious theology of the current threat to liberalism that is identity politics. For a fuller treat treatment, I refer you again to the chapter that Brother Bede Mullins and I wrote for the forthcoming edited volume and upon which much of this lecture was based. The volume is entitled Augustine in a Time of Crisis, Palgrave Macmillan, January 2021. Thank you so much for your attention. And I'm terribly sorry we could not do this in person and enjoy conversation and drinks afterwards. 
God bless.